God wants us to live from the center, but we can't and we won't as long as we're drawn to the circumference. This Lent, this is what we're using, an image of a circle to think about what repentance in this Lenten journey looks like. As we said last week, circles are circles because of two things. There's a center and then there's a circumference. The circumference, that's the shallower, the showier edge that bumps up against the world. The center is that deep place in our life, our soul, where God dwells. And our spiritual lives are just like the circles. God wants us to live out of the center, this place where we feel whole and loved and welcomed. It's the place we feel forgiven, where the spirit dwells. The circumference, it's the shallower, it's the showier place that receives tremendous praise and tremendous blame from the world. We don't have to be honest about ourselves when we live on the circumference. We just have to be free to receive whatever the world washes up on our shores. We should be spiritual people who desire to live out of the center. And we need to own the fact that we are all circumference people. And I don't think anything illustrates this point quite better than the parable of the prodigal son. And there's so much about life and the feelings that we have of depth and pain and the human struggle. It's on full display in this parable. It's no wonder it stands as perhaps the most significant teaching in all of the Bible. And it still has something to say to us today. So I'm going to jump back in and work my way through it. If you want to follow along, Luke 15, this is very familiar, but it's got a lot of meat. We'll start in verse 11. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that belongs to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. The youngest son was at the center. He was at his father's dwelling place. And he chose a distant country. He chose the circumference. He was at the place where all things dwell. And he gave it up for the shallower, showier life. But it doesn't last him long. Verse 14. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout the country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of the country who sent him to, in the field to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating. And no one was giving him anything. This is what happens. This is the risk of living on the circumference. This is what it means when we say this is where we receive both tremendous praise and tremendous blame from the world. When things are going great out on the circumference, it is awesome to be there. We are well-known people like us. When things are not going well, well, he would have gladly filled himself with the food that you feed to pigs. But no one would give him even that. And this is where a lot of us live, out here on the circumference. It's the roll of the dice. Then sometimes it'll be good. Sometimes it'll be bad, but every day there's a chance it'll be good. I will say, the younger son rolls the dice. For a while it works, and then it doesn't. He sees a world full of possibilities, full of everything, and he wants it. So much he throws his whole self out into it. Every idea, every dollar, living life out on the circumference because it's fun and it's lively and he can be as far away from the center as possible. There's no moral compass the further you get. There's nothing drawing you back. There's no father telling you no. There's just you and the world and what the potentiality of the world responding to you is. Someone out here may just notice you 
And do you know people like this? You're probably like this. But one thing I know, from the text and from life and from trying, it's impossible to maintain this life. It doesn't last. It's exhausting. You're always on the hunt when you're out there and you're always living out of either your ego or your insecurity. Dallas Willard, I think, words this perfectly. He wrote a book called The Divine Conspiracy and he says this, egotism and insecurity are the reactions to the anxiety about whether we really count. It's a desperate response to the need that we all have to count for something, to be irreplaceable without a price. The younger son feels replaceable. He feels like he has a price. That's why he wanted what was his so he could spend it on his terms. He desperately wants to count for something. He just doesn't know where to find it. And come to think of it, we're the same. It's hard not to think of our worthiness having a price. We often think if we just achieve enough or take on enough projects or make good enough grades or be funny enough, tell enough good stories, then somebody will notice. Somebody will tell us we're worthy to be out here. Someone will notice and tell us that we are irreplaceable. The world couldn't exist without us out here. Someone will notice and tell us maybe that we're loved. We think we have to be on the circumference to be loved. And there lies the great irony. We look out into the world for our assurances, knowing full well the Father is back home and has always loved us. But to go back, back to the place that we burned down and destroyed, we would have to admit that we failed. We would have to repent so we don't. And that's the peculiar thing about the circumference. As long as we're out here, even though it doesn't satisfy, we know it's not going to satisfy, but it tells us tomorrow it might. So we never repent. We just hunker down and we try again tomorrow. I mean, that's what the prodigal son does until he is flat out of everything. He has nothing left. And the story shows us, if it shows us anything, it shows us what happens when we do turn from the circumference. Even if it's out of sheer desperation, if it's in order to just live and to stay alive, if we turn back to the center, we'll be found. I mean, scripture says this in verse 17. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will go get up and I will go to my father. And I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm not worthy to be called your son. Treat me like a hired hand. So he set off and he goes to his father. But while he is still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion and ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. I mean, this right here, this is a case study of what happens when we return back to God. This is the moment of repentance and the Father's act of undeserving love. It is such a powerful moment. In verse 21, then the Father said to him, or then the Son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father quickly interrupts and says to his slaves, quick, bring out the robe, the best one, put it on him, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and get the fattened calf and kill it. Let us eat, let us celebrate for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to celebrate. I mean, it should end there. I mean, it's such a beautiful story. When we return to the center, we're met by a loving God who forgives. And here's the thing about this traveling back to the center. No matter how far off you've gone, it's not like you have to go all the way back before you meet God. The Father meets you when you turn. This son of mine was dead. 
and is alive again. He was lost and is now found. I mean, this is the gospel. This is the good news of God through Jesus Christ as best as we have it. What was true for the prodigal son in Luke 15 is still true today. But like I said, this is a case study. The youngest shows what turning from the circumference looks like. But the story doesn't end with him. There's the older son who shows us the exact opposite. Verse 25. Now his elder son was in the field. When he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called out to one of the slaves and asked what was going on. And the slave replied, your brother has come. Your father has killed the fattened calf because he has got back safe and sound. Then he became angry. He refused to go in. I don't think there's been enough attention on this side of the story. But oh man, does it hit home and fit within this case study. The oldest son has always operated out of the center, but he turns from it too. I mean, look how this unfolds. Verse 28, I couldn't write this better. His father came out and began to plead with him, but he answered his father, listen, for all these years I've been working like a slave for you. I've never disobeyed your command, yet you have never given even a young goat to me so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours come, came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, by the way, you killed the fattened calf for him. And then the father said, son, you've always been with me. All that's mine is yours. But we had to celebrate. We had to rejoice because this brother of yours was dead And has come back to life. He was lost and is now found. And that's the story. That's how Jesus ends it in front of the Pharisees in the temple. It ends with the oldest son literally standing on the circumference of the house. Too upset to return to the party. And we get no resolution. Does he go in? Does he not? Does he turn back to the center? Does he hear what the father had to say? Or is he unforgiving? Is he angry? Is he jealous? Is he frustrated? He loses his place within the circle because he couldn't make room for his brother's return. There's something we need to see from this angle that pulls us away from the gospel. I know we often think of ourselves as the youngest prodigal son. But the truth is, the larger global church has played the role of the older son for far too long. We've judged, bickered, pout. We draw hard lines in the sand, unwilling to compromise or to think beyond. I mean, this erosion of shame, it pushes us away from the center. We actually become somewhat disgusted with the center. And we even turn that disgust on to God. Think about that. When we get disappointed that we're not held in high enough esteem, we shame those who have returned from the circumference. And without knowing it, we replace them. I mean, the story literally ends with the older brother choosing the circumference of the house. He just can't go back in. Which begs the question, what was his original motive for staying near the father? Which begs a deeper question. Can we think we're in the center when we're actually not at all? Absolutely. Now, finally, this case study is not over because there's another character, the father. We have to see his capacity for letting the son go to the circumference and then bless the young, older child for staying, but then also forgive the younger son for returning and then leaving the party to go out onto the veranda to meet the oldest son who's on the circumference who can't return to the party. The father is able to do both. Which brings up a final point. We don't choose our center. 
all we can do is repent, turn from the worldly ways and the circumference, and we start heading back. The Spirit of God lets us know when we've arrived. God meets us on our journey, and our soul knows it and feels it. It knows what it's like to be held and whole. And it's time, I think, we take this parable seriously. Don't be afraid to explore the shadow side of your life and the parts of you that are on the circumference. Some part of you is. But if you can know yourself better, then you could turn and give that part of yourself to God. If you can do this, then you'll be able to see God noticing you. And the irony is you'll realize you're being noticed and you're worthy and you are irreplaceable. And you are being told that you're loved because the truth is you are. Whether you're the oldest or the youngest in this case study, either way, you are still loved by the Father. And the Father has the capacity to meet you wherever you are. So what are we waiting for? It's time we head back to the center. It's time we repent and go back to God.